This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Stanford University's Fei Fei Li discusses her book, The Worlds I See, Curiosity, Exploration, and Discovery at the Dawn of AI. She speaks about her life and journey to becoming one of the leading scientists in the field of artificial intelligence. She's interviewed by new scientist technology reporter, Jeremy Su. Before we get to this week's episode, we want to take a minute to ask for your help. Your financial support will ensure that C-SPAN can continue to produce podcasts that inform you about national politics, introduce you to the latest nonfiction books, and provide valuable historical context to today's news. Make a donation today and be a part of C-SPAN's future. Visit c-span.org slash donate. It's great to be with you to hear to talk about your new book. Hi, Jeremy. I'm very excited. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's my pleasure to talk with you. Um, I guess maybe just to kick things off, uh, this feels like both a memoir, but also sort of your uh, tour through the history of AI development. And I'm curious about how, in the course of thinking about and writing this book, you decided to pull those threads together. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy, for asking that question. So um, this book project started more than three years ago at the invitation of a book publisher. And originally, I really thought I was just writing an AI book uh, from what I see where it is uh, computer vision, visual intelligence, ImageNet, the deep learning revolution, and uh, eventually human-centered AI. And I thought I was writing... Uh, I knew I was going to write it for the general public. But after a year of finishing a draft, a very dear friend of mine, um, actually a philosopher, Professor Zhang H. Mendy, uh, my co-director at Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI, read the draft and told me to rewrite. And uh, I was pretty shocked. Um, he had a point. He said that... Um, uh, AI technology as a story can be told by many people, but I have a unique perspective as a woman technologist, as an immigrant, as someone who has traversed life in, in very different ways from your typical Silicon Valley technologist. And that story uh, will, will give a unique uh, way of telling, explaining what AI is. And I, I did take his uh, suggestion to heart. So at the end, this book is a double helix of um, two stories, the coming of age of an AI scientist, as well as the coming of age of modern AI. And serendipitously, they intertwine each other. And my own, my own fate, as well as my own work, is very much uh, uh, intertwined with uh, what's happening to AI. So, so that's what you have right now as a science memoir. Well, I'm I'm so glad you took up that challenge to to rewrite the book, even though I'm sure that was incredibly daunting to hear initially. Because I, I <laughs> well, do it think... delayed it for two years. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, but because I do feel like having read the book, it, it is incredibly an incredibly rewarding and and uh, rich narrative with those threads, as you've noted, sort of intertwined throughout. Um, yeah. Maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe just a. Um, Let's. I mean, I guess beginnings of stories are often hard to think about, when, especially when you're thinking about your life. You know, telling, mm -hmm. talking about your life and talking about the course of your work. And I'm curious, what made you choose to open the book with the scene that you did, which is, you know, you preparing to testify uh, in a congressional hearing about AI. Right, um, Jeremy. So that was my first congressional hearing in the world of AI. And of course, since then, I have done uh, more. That was 2018. And even though compared to now, the public has not fully woken up to AI yet. But to me, um, around that time, it symbolizes an important inflection point is where when AI goes from in vitro to in vivo, which means that uh, it's no longer a lab science that I found personally so curious and fascinating. It's it's a transformative force to the change of our future and of our society. So as an AI scientist, I actually wanted to open the book with a scene that 
I was uncomfortable with because, as、mm. a scientist, I'm very I'm very comfortable in the lab. I'm very comfortable working with students, but I was probably still am uncomfortable facing the public, facing the policy world. Yet I recognize there is a responsibility, and I wanted to open the book with a little bit of that tension,、um, and、uh, really get to the core of what AI is today. is is a changing force. is a、um, It, it, it's going to impact human lives. I do think that choice of that scene it, it does, as you noted, encapsulate that tension really well, and sort of both the promise and pitfalls that sort of like、uh, yes. everyone was grappling with around AI,、uh, and that we are still grappling with now.、Um, yeah. What I did also like about that scene was that it also brought in that personal thread, where you know, I guess this becomes a recurrent theme in the book.、Um, You were also, you know, constantly try, having to pay attention to the health of your mother, and then sort of、mm. your interactions with her during those times, and even the fact that she encouraged you to do this uh, this uh, testimony in front of Congress. Yeah, yeah, it, it it truly is the true story. I I was literally in ICU with her leading up to the flight and.、Uh, It's a little bit of a symbolism of the story of my life is the the pull of being human、mm. and the 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 everyday realness of being human and and the the the, the a little bit more surreal a little bit more、um, the removed reality of being a nerd a scientist working on a very very almost sci-fi like technology it it has just been that dual thread and.、Uh, I appreciate what、uh, my mom and my parents have given me that kind of freedom and respect, and、uh, and I was very very heartened to that the 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 Congress、uh, woman and congressman、um, actually、uh, said hi to my mom on camera. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought that was a really nice、uh, touch, which I guess kind of in a sense not to spoil too much, but I guess it helps to. Diffuse a little of the tension that you had sort of entered、yeah. with. <laughs>、yeah. um, so I, I guess I'd like to then maybe take a step back and look at again. I think you've touched a bit on this already. Sort of these broader themes that are running throughout the book, and、uh, some of them that I thought were especially、uh, potent were the themes of sort of this feeling of dislocation that you and your family experienced throughout your journey. You know. In China and in the U.S., and、uh, combined with that, I guess is this other theme of the North Star. So、mm-hmm. it'd be great to hear, I guess, your your thoughts on sort of just like how maybe those, that interplay between those has maybe shaped the story that you're telling. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks for asking. You 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 said it right. This book, the 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 Core message of this book and the story is the pursuit of a north star. This is why when I was writing this book, I have so much a young audience in my mind. I was hoping to have a conversation with that young audience because I wanted to to just share with them the 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 process of through one's life when you. Are relentlessly pursuing a north star passion, curiosity against all odds, and it's a very authentic、um, passion, authentic drive, and、uh, and it it probably it makes it more real that when you are contextualized, they contextualizing that in、um, in an immigration story because.、Uh, Being an immigrant is also a, a, a journey of exploration, a, a journey of unknown, and you pile that on top of a scientific journey towards the unknown. It, it has very interesting interplay between each other. But no matter how you look at it, whether you look at it through、um, exploration, through learning, through the courage of、uh, the fearlessness of.、Um, Um, you know, trying to discover, or you look at it through resilience, through perseverance, through compassion of so many people supporting me.、Um, mm. I think they they all culminate, culminate 
into the same thing, which is that, uh, um, you know, relentless uh, uh, drive and focus towards um, reaching a North Star that you believe in. I guess speaking of that, um, that courage and also that resilience of sort of the people who supported you throughout this journey, I did, of course, want to put a, a bit of attention on your parents uh, because I think one early mention of the North Star was descri- you describing their North Star, which is, uh, I think, as you put it, the pursuit of opportunity without limits was their North Star. And so I, I'd just love to hear a bit more about their influence on your life and your career. And it seems like especially your mother um, really insisting that you follow your intellectual passions despite whatever challenges you and the family were facing at the time. Yeah, thanks for asking me, Jeremy. You know, it it take me, I don't know, 40 plus years later to actually fully digest and understand their their impact. And the irony is, especially in this day and age, parenting is such an intense job, right? Um, mm-hmm. The irony is, I think their biggest impact or, or, or guidance or whatever you call it, is leaving me alone <laughs> in the sense of giving me that freedom. You know, when when you are, uh, when I was a teenager in Persephone, New Jersey, the family situation, financial situation was definitely not good, yet they left me alone to do physics in college. You know, when I was given the opportunity to go to Wall Street with lucrative pay, they gave me the freedom to go to do PhD in Caltech. Um, th- there are just many moments in hindsight I realized the, the, the best parenting maybe, at least in my case, for me, um, is the freedom. Yet, hmm. that is also coupled with their own embodiment. My parents are not sophisticated people. You know, compared to me, they don't have my level of exposure to the world. They don't have my level of, um, you know, scholarship or, or, or education. But they are, they are resilient people. And they embody a, a, the kind of courage that defines millions and millions and generations of American immigrants. Um, the one heartwarming thing about publishing this book is I hear from readers their own family's immigration story. And over and over again, it just reminds me, we're a very normal immigrant family. It's uh, My story is such a typical story. America... America embodies that spirit, and my parents embody that spirit. And that spirit just became, it became in my, in the AI technical term, become my training data. You know, I just, uh, I just learned that uh, and learned to embody that without them telling me what to major, what job to choose. They wouldn't even have understood what, how to do that. Yeah, it's um thank you for sharing that. I, I I do have to say, yeah, personally I did also connect with certain aspects of sort of the immigrant immigrant family experience you laid I out. I can totally though, imagine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> even though I think in many ways your parents also were very are you know, are very singular people and, and incredible <laughs> role models in, in their own rights. Um I guess speaking of other people that I guess you who you've connected with over intellectual passions and sort of who encouraged your, you know, pursuit of your intellectual passions. Uh, You know, there is, um, of course, Bob Sabella, and then his wife, Jean, and I'd love to hear more about sort of how their presence early in sort of your uh, life in the U.S. helped shape the trajectory of your life and work as well. Right. Um... Well, I'm not going to give away everything in the book, but uh, I think it's so important when I wrote the book, I knew that I need to be the voice to acknowledge and celebrate the legacy of my high school teacher, Bob Sabella, and his family. Because once again, there are just hundreds of thousands, millions of American teachers 
who who work in a public high school, nothing remarkable, yet um, his uh, kindness, his generosity, and his belief in a you know a teenage immigrant girl's passion for uh, STEM um, changed the course of my destiny, and um, they are Bob is. Probably, uh, I, I, not probably, is definitively my first real American friend. Even though he was uh, he was a teacher, so his family is my first American family, and、uh, mm. they are what America is to me. From a small town in New Jersey,、uh, the 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 kind of embodiment of compassion, kindness, and and value, and to this day, I I think I. I began my American life in the in under the wings of、uh, the Sabella family, and、uh, I hope I continue to live with that kind of、uh, value. And、uh, in hindsight, a friend told me just a few days ago.、Uh, they say that、uh, this book is、uh, is a love letter, and I realize it is. It is foremost a love letter for science, for for the North Star, for the pursuit of. Curiosity and knowledge and discovery, but it's also equally important a love letter for people. It's、uh, you know for the people who have supported me, for the people who have their own vision in life and have inspired me, and、uh, eventually for the people that my technology will will impact. But Bob and and the Sabella family、um, is one of the most important character. That this love letter is for, to to really express my gratitude after all these decades. I think that really does come out <laughs> quite well in the book, and I can definitely see that.、Um, I'm、I、very think, glad to hear. <laughs> it seems like one thing also that maybe links many of the most important people who you describe in the book in your life is、uh, the sense of insatiable curiosity, or at least encouraging. Sort of that sense of such insatiable curiosity and that pursuit of intellectual passions, and that seems to,、uh, you know, be a constant theme with the teachers, the students, everyone who you meet and sort of like gather around you in the course of this.、Mm-hmm. Um, and、yeah. it, also, in a broad sense, it does seem like maybe that seems to be why you you seem to be especially fond of the world of academia. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about why. The world of academia, you know, has meant so much to you, and what you think its role is going to be as we continue to move forward with AI research and development. Yeah. So, Jeremy, my own view or my experience, and I guess as my、uh, career expands into leadership, my my understanding, my view of academia has also evolved.、Uh, in the early part of my career, where I was just solely focusing on making the science, I think academia really symbolizes a、uh, a space to do relentless and fearless pursuit of curiosity and knowledge. Right? It's、mm-hmm. it's where you're working not for profit. You 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 don't really have a boss, and、uh, you're just. Together with fellow scientists, computer scientists, engineers, who are just so fascinated by making science, and that gives me the kind of freedom and、uh, sense of limitless, limitlessness that is so important for、um, for for the pursuit of knowledge. And I think、um, I I do sincerely hope that whether it's、uh, academia. Or public sector, or even possibly industry labs, that very precious core is protected for those who are actually doing the, the daily science. As、um, mm. as AI、um, expanded into the society, and、uh, as AI's impact becomes much more complex, my own role. Within public sector has also evolved into a leadership role. I've co-founded、uh, Stanford's、uh, Institute for Human Center AI, which is our country's first dedicated、um, major university institute to to really put the human centered、uh, framework towards AI education and research. I also become.、Um, 
very intimately involved in uh, bridging um, Silicon Valley, bridging AI with the policy world. I also see academia as an incredibly critical part of the public sector. And um, earlier this year, in June, in June, I met with President Biden. And in that meeting, I shared with President Biden that this is a pivotal moment to invest in public sector AI. We, we should, you know, adapt a moonshot mentality because public sector AI is uh, going to be very critical part of uh, uh, AI ecosystem. But right now we're experiencing a crisis. We're experiencing a severe imbalance of resourcing. Not a single university in America can train a chat GPT model. And, mm -hmm. and this is already, we're talking a year after chat GPT models have even, in industry have even increased in size. So we're seeing that widening gap and uh, if we don't resource the public sector, we don't resource academia, we're going to start seeing the, the consequence of missed opportunity for much further scientific um, discovery, as I personally experienced in my early days of career. Uh, but this time, the discovery can be much more profound from uh, discovering of a cure for rare diseases, to mapping biodiversity, to discovering new materials. But it also will deprive the public of the opportunity of a much more trusted way of understanding, explaining, and evaluating what this technology is. So that's, that's kind of the, the uh, gist of how I see academia as a fellow scientist, but now also as an AI leader. Yeah, thank you for sharing all that. And I think you brought up a lot of issues in the course of that, which I would love to return to. Um, I did want to take a maybe a first a step back just, again, to those early days of your academic research career where and sort mm -hmm. of how you've thought about the development of artificial intelligence. And um, one, it seems, really uh, important theme there was the idea of vision actually unlocking intelligence, not only in sort of like biological intelligence among animals and then humans, but also as we see with the course of your work with artificial intelligence. So I was wondering uh, if you could sort of briefly take us through that journey and that thought process. Yeah. Well, that was actually the fun, the very fun experience of writing the book is how do I explain what visual intelligence means to me? Because mm. at the end of the day, everything began with my just really um, intense curiosity in understanding intelligence, right? I, I came from physics. So as a physics student, you are kind of just infused to uh, to to be the kind of scientist who ask audacious questions. You're not afraid to to ask questions like the smallest particle of atoms, the the the, the beginning of space time, the the limit of the universe. And I became so interested in intelligence itself. And uh, what captured me about vision is um, it is the oldest one of the oldest sensory system of the animal world. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was conjectured that with vision and perception, the animal world started to evolve in a much more intense way. And if you look at how today's animal world, including humans, we use visual intelligence and perception to do so many things. Of course, basic, a basic survival, but we uh, interact with each other, we communicate, we understand what's going on, we, in, inter, we, we change our environment, we make tools. Of course, today we work, we drive, we entertain. We yeah. use vision in a primary way. So if we can unlock what, what, how to be visually intelligent, we can unlock a huge part of this intelligence problem. So that's, that's how I began my journey in vision. And this is why I call it a North Star problem because, uh, because it's just so hard and it's so important. <laughs>
Yeah, and that that North Star problem, it seems, led you to, you know, one of uh, the contributions I think many people who are who know anything at all about AI research really know you for, which is ImageNet. Um, I I was wondering for people who may not be familiar with that, how, could you briefly explain what ImageNet is and how sort of your pursuit of that North Star led to it? Yeah, um, ImageNet is a project, is a data set. It's a, the first true big data, massive data set in the world of AI. I guess uh, um, in hindsight, it defined uh, the modern AI's methodology of being driven by big data. It also mm-hmm. defined a very important North Star problem in the world of uh, computer vision and AI, which is to uh, enable computers to understand everyday objects. And when I say everyday objects, there are tens and thousands of different kinds. So it's a very big scale problem. And uh, uh, with ImageNet's release in 2009, uh, and and then we, as we open source this data set, uh, large data set and large uh, critical problem, we contributed to the moment that many people in the world of AI call it the, the, the onset of deep learning revolution, which is 2012, a group of computer scientists led by Professor Jeff Hinton in University of Toronto participated in the ImageNet challenge, which uses this big data uh, um, resource and two GPUs and uh, a, a neural network algorithm and this convergence of these three things made um, made a a major uh, breakthrough in the, in the um, method or the tool of uh, of AI. So so that's why ImageNet was played a a, a role um, in this uh, in this current revolution of AI. I think the way you laid it out. I mean, in retrospect, it all seems to make a lot of sense. But it, I think it's important to note that at the time, this was far from an obvious move to try to build such a huge data set uh, manually <laughs> by hand. And, and it seems like you obviously faced actually probably overwhelming skepticism, even from like colleagues who were active AI researchers at the time. And I'm wondering if, if there are any particular high and or low points that you would highlight without, you know, spoiling too much of the book. Yeah, Jeremy, so as the book actually spends some time detailing that journey, and the goal of that detailing is really about sharing the, the, the making of science. I guess the making of science is just like making of sausage. It's very messy. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, and it's very normal to, to, to find skepticism in, in science. And it's not nothing ill-intentioned. This is, after all, the, the whole profession of doing science is exploring the unknown. And if when you explore the unknown, nobody knows the answer. And you've got many smart people having their own hypothesis. And we always debate and disagree. We probably always disagree more than we agree. And so in because of that, in a way, it... it it felt natural to me. I, of course, I wasn't thrilled with joy when people disagree with me. But on the other hand, I was unfazed um, because to a large extent, that's part of the scientific life. It got a little dicey that, uh, you know, we had very little uh, resource. Um, most graduate students didn't think that is a very important project. And, uh, and I had my early career in academia, um, on, on the, you know, on the test, because if I didn't get this project done, it might severely impact my, um, professional advancement in, in, in academia. There's a very important moment called tenure where you, sure. you, you have to be kind of assessed and say, okay, you're good enough to be a professor for, uh, for a long time. And, and I kind of put my career on the spot with this ImageNet project. But in the meantime, I got incredible student who, uh, 
believed in this. I in the book I talk about my graduate student Jaden and、uh, who was brilliant, and we collaborated on this. I've got my collaborator, Professor Kai Li from Princeton. So I also had a, a, a very small, but I had a community of fellow travelers.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and that group seems like、uh, it, as you detail in the book, hey, there's there was、uh, this select band of people who believed, at least in supporting、yeah. the vision early on, which seemed to make a big difference.、Uh, yes, and we're still very close friends, maybe because <laughs> of that. <laughs> right, the trial by fire, I guess. Through, through yeah. Those days.、Uh, this is, I mean, I, I I try not to post too many counterfactuals, but I guess I'm just curious in terms of. Do you think if someone was pursuing a similar project in AI research now, that seemed incredibly audacious and maybe just would potentially go against the grain for the majority of the AI research community's thought process?、Um, I know the research、uh, environment now for AI is very different from when <laughs> you were doing, you know, looking into ImageNet.、Yeah. But I, I guess I'm curious if you have any thoughts on. How that research environment has changed, and at this、yeah. point, whether it would be sort of conducive to the, that kind of you know bold, sort of like maybe risky bet. <laughs> yeah,、uh, Jeremy, that's a great question. I, you know, I wonder about that too because、mm. um, I, I've never experienced doing science under this much limelight. And that's not as a scientist,、um, a, a genuine scientist. Nobody goes into science for 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 spotlight. It's just not the kind of profession we go. Bec- we enter science because of curiosity, because of what is unknown. So, so this field right now has has a you know a unusual、um, amount of attention. But in the meantime, it also is giving a lot of resource, especially if you're in industry, and and that also my look at look at、uh, ChatGPT, right?、Mm-hmm. Um, that journey started seven years ago,、um, and、uh, and the transformer paper was published about six years ago, and、uh, even though it was a fairly famous paper from an academic、uh, scholarship point of view, but it's not a Public celebrity paper. Yet a group of people pursued it, and、um, and made a huge, you know,、uh, advancement. And and then we have ChatGPT as a product. So that that is yet another example of showing that, regardless of the、um, the macro environment,、um, at the end of the day, the making of science is still about passion, conviction. And the authentic pursuit of just trying to do the discovery and innovation, and I do hope, at least for myself and my own lab and collaborators, that doesn't change. It is、mm. harder sometimes, especially for the younger generation, to be under so much spotlight or to think that they can use the spotlight to、um, promote their work. I, I, there's nothing wrong. I I I just find this a different environment than、uh, than、um, you know my generation, and I think it's a new challenge this this new generation will face, and、uh, and we'll have to、uh, we'll have to kind of devise different tools to to、um, deal with this challenge. But I still do believe there are there's a lot more. Discovery and innovation to be made.、Hmm. Since、um, ChatGPT has come up a few times now at this point,、uh, I'm wondering if you could、uh, help us trace、uh, the connections between sort of the earlier work that you did with computer vision and and those algorithms and ImageNet and how that push. Which also included scaling up the training data sets for AI, also maybe coincided or unlocked、uh, some similar developments in natural language processing, which then led to sort of what we see now: ChatGPT and other AI chatbots based on these large language models. 
Yeah, well, um, the best way to tell the, 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 the story that links ImageNet and ChatGPT is probably through Ilya, right? Because, mm. um, the, 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 the famous ImageNet, uh, uh, challenge winning paper by Professor Jeff Hinton, um, the, the two student authors were Alex and, uh, Ilya and, uh, Ilya actually saw big data even as a student. So that's why he participated in ImageNet. And then fast forward, um, you know, the, the, it, there's no question the way that um, OpenAI scaled up the transformer model was, um, was because there is a strong belief and hypothesis that big data drives the kind of technological advancement. So, um, I, I think that's, that's, that's definitely one layer. Mm-hmm. Um, what happens with the image netting back in 2012 is that the, the combination of image net and neural network, um, and of course GPU computing was really the, 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 the perfect mix of the three critical ingredients of modern AI. And, uh, and since that point on, uh, the methodology of AI algorithm just switched uh, massively to neural network. Be- mm-hmm. Before that, there are many different kinds of algorithms, from Bayesian net to you know um, support vector machines to to other uh, other kind of uh, methods. So so, and if you look at ChatGPT, it is just the latest, or, or look at what I would say, large language models. It is the latest manifestation of the neural network algorithms. And I, I don't think it's the last. I think we'll have more um, different ones. But again, that lineage traces back to uh, what we call the image that Alex that moment. Um, so there is a lot of intellectual connectivity um, as all sciences are. And I also want to say ImageNet is not the beginning of all. ImageNet itself is also inspired by other science, by, by other work, in, including my own graduate school work, which I talked about in, in the book, mm-hmm. but it's also inspired by cognitive science and all that. So science truly, like Isaac Newton said, um, any scientist, even as great as Isaac Newton stands on the shoulders of giants, science truly is, is really the, 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 the continued, um, progress over the 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 previous uh, discovery and and uh, work I think that first um, I guess you'd say maybe half or two thirds of the book really do take uh, the reader through that mm-hmm. often r- rather thrilling journey of sort of scientific discovery and just figuring out these early um, foundations for what is now modern artificial intelligence uh, but the later half of your book then starts to really grapple much more head on with sort of the implications of what we're seeing now with uh, these large language models, with AI deployments, uh, with ChatGBT and sort of the societal implications, the ethical implications. And I guess I'm, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on uh, now that you've sort of helped usher in this era of big data and, you know, even large uh, AI models. uh, You you also note in the book that this all comes at a human cost, you know, even just like putting together big data. And I'm wondering what you would highlight as sort of your takeaways on that now, looking back and also looking forward as we're sort of in this ongoing era of AI development. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, thanks for asking that. Uh, This is actually, um, you know, this is why this book authentically traverses my journey as a scientist in constant evolution. And also, you know, as I write the book with my friend, um, we're like, what's after image that? How do we write the story after image that we could stop at the image that story, which mm-hmm. would be the, the pure scientific story. But what was so obvious and so authentic and so important is AI becoming, um, in vivo. AI is no longer this private, um, science that I love. AI is changing the business changing the, 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 the users, changing our society. And with every powerful tool 
humanity has ever invented, be it fire, steam, electricity, nuclear, whatever, biotech, every powerful tool, we introduce the good, bad, and the ugly.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, AI is no exception. It's a very powerful tool.、Uh, but you know, when when scientists and technologists living the labs making this tool, they were just like me, maybe. Driven by curiosity, driven by that sense of discovery, but once we introduce this tool to the society, we see both opportunities as well as perils. And I begin my own self-reflection of what is the role a scientist can play, as we are responsible in introducing this powerful tool to our society,、mm -hmm. and that's when the book start to explore. A much more non-linear part of the story.、Um, on one hand, I also expanded my scientific discovery towards healthcare because it is such a、uh, important application of AI. It's so personal to me, and I see so many good opportunities. On the other hand, I also experienced the societal change of seeing AI from fascination to tech clash to A very intense mixture of emotions and reactions. And as an educator, as a, a leader, how do I play a constructive role? Right. This、mm -hmm. is when I begin to、uh, realize we need to build this institute for human-centered AI. We need to invest in policy work. We need to double down on education, not only. Um, the ethical education of technology within Stanford, but also a, a education to the public, to the to the journalists, to the、um, policymakers, to the business executives, because because they will be using and communicating and making laws about AI. So so that become also part of my effort. But I guess、um, all、mm -hmm. of this, whether it's healthcare, whether it's、um, My institute, whether it's education, whether it's policy, it boils down to my sense of responsibility, because I feel my generation is the first generation that、uh, brought this into the world, and we have a responsibility to contribute and to make a positive difference. I think speaking of some of those、uh, that promise and perils that you've sort of laid out.、Uh, It's. I think many people have probably seen. It's very common nowadays、uh, for certain tech leaders to talk about the idea of artificial general intelligence and just this idea of that maybe someday there will be a superhuman AI that will, you know, as they might describe it, eliminate a lot, pretty much everyone's jobs,、um, and that may have both benefits and downsides depending on who you ask.、Um, But I think your vision that you just you've touched on about human-centered、uh, AI is pretty different from that. So I'd be interested to hear more. Oh, can you tell us more about how human-centered AI relates AI to human beings? Yeah. So、um, look, I I know what you're asking. Especially、uh, the airwave is filled of talks of、uh, general sentient.、Um, AI technology that will eliminate、uh, all jobs or or whatever large percentage. Intellectually, I respect that kind of discussion. Of course, I do because in academia we've got people wondering about、uh, other planets with life, wondering about how to make a robot that go into your blood vessels. You know, all these kind of very.、Um, You can call it imaginative, but you can also call it, you know, even radical ideas are part of intellectual exploration, and uh, and uh, I totally respect that. But that doesn't translate to a、um, imbalanced and sometimes、uh, irresponsible communication with the public,、mm. because、uh, we we need to, we have responsibility to explain what this is. And to highlight important impacts of this technology to everyday people, and whether 
you know, I'm also an everyday person. I use AI just like you use AI, whether I'm looking for recommendations of information or whether I'm navigating to drive somewhere and whether I'm using large language models to help my writing. So as a public, we need to um, know what's going on. And we also, as, as AI technologists, need to inform the, 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 the policymakers, the community leaders, the public about the real, um, the real risks. And when I say real risks, I know, I don't think about these large intellectual curiosity exercises like sentientness. Mm -hmm. I actually think about, you know, the bias issue. The privacy infringement, the, the job disruption, the, 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 the disinformation and democracy, uh, weaponization. These are real issues. They are much more immediate. They are where rubber meets the road and they will impact. They'll become catalysts that will impact the entire social fabric and, uh, you know, humanity continues to invent, but in our course of history, we've had very, um, very, very dark periods. And, you know, we mm -hmm. all remember or somehow learn about World War II. What exactly made that happen? Is it the Industrial Revolution? Is it, you know, a cultural religious clash? Is it, we don't know, but we should be uh, mindful, careful, thoughtful about this. And AI is going to play a role in social changes. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, I think you mentioned the tech clash earlier, and it's even featured in the beginning of your book. And obviously, we're seeing that continue to play out in a lot of in a lot of different ways. Um, I, I guess as as sort of, and I know you sort of were also a bit <laughs> you had your own experience with that. Well, even though most of your career was in, was in academia, you did spend a bit of time with Google Cloud, where you sort of got to see mm -hmm. a lot of what was playing out firsthand. And um, I'm wondering if there was anything from that experience of just, you know, working at that, at the leading edge of a company which is de continuing to deploy a lot of AI services. Are there any big takeaways and lessons that you have from there about sort of these themes that you've just touched on about the need to uh, keep a sort of human-centered AI focus? Yeah. So first of all, I, when I was on my sabbatical at Google, it was such a uh, illuminating experience. It was so wonderful to really see the technology being scaled up. And also in Google Cloud, it's where the business is delivering technology to billions of users through the, 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 uh, cloud distribution. And, uh, that means we get to talk to, you know, individual developers all the way to Fortune 50 large companies and seeing how that technology can be used by, by people. And that was for an academic uh, scholar. That was such an illuminating and, and thrilling experience. In mm. the meantime, around that time, it was the first phase or the, the, the beginning of the messiness of a powerful technology like AI hitting the world, right? Uh, I don't know if you remember, it was right after Cambridge Analytica. Uh, mm -hmm. There were the first reported self-driving car deaths. There mm -hmm. was facial recognition al algorithms uh, doing horrible, biased, um, you know, uh, recognition results. And there are, you know, debates about AI's uh, defense um, use or military use. That is all part of the messiness. It's, uh, um, it's all part of when you introduce a powerful tool to the society, especially for those nerds who made this technology, were not prepared or were not educated in thinking in, in all these possibilities. And it was extremely educational. It also made me firmly believe that um, for the future generation of technologists that we're going to train, especially in a place like Stanford, they should no longer be like my generation. My generation never learned about ethics in class. We're, mm. It's not a required part of the curriculum. Uh, we're just trying to make a small neural network work. But now this new generation um, is facing a much more powerful tool, and we have to give them more tools like 
ethical design, user-centered thinking, human-centered framework. And that became my new North Star of expanding pure AI technology pursuit to human-centered AI uh, technology. As I guess as part of that, uh, as part of your role in sort of trying to impart that lesson to the new generations of uh, young AI researchers who are under your tutelage, uh, I know you've touched on already sort of like how you think this broader holistic education around the societal and ethical implications is important. Is there anything else you would highlight uh, as maybe being important for someone to keep in mind, even if someone's just thinking about maybe pursuing a career in AI research now? I actually want to say to so many young people, because I get that question out there, is can I participate in AI? I'm not a hacker when I was five or I actually love dancing, or I'm an English major, or I'm a young lawyer. Uh, my answer to all of you is, of course, because this is a horizontal technology. We need uh, my kind of students, my students' kind of talents, which are engineers and computer scientists, but we actually need more multidimensional talents, whether you are in social science or in arts and humanities or in business or in policy making, because this technology is has so many faces. You know, we need policymakers who actually know enough about what this technology is. So as a young lawyer, young, you know, someone aspiring to enter, say, government uh, and governance, I encourage you to participate in AI, take AI classes, know enough about AI because it's important. As an artist, it is so important as creators now, your voices are heard. We are grappling with generative AI's implication to creative industry. We also see its empowerment to creative industry, uh, whether it's music or art or writing. So knowing what this is, knowing how you can use this technology, but also have a voice in determining where this technology is going is super important. So I I do think this is, um, you know, I keep returning to this is when AI has become in vivo. It has mm-hmm. entered the society. It needs talents from all walks of life to participate in this. Yeah, and I think, um, I guess this, for me, this at least <laughs> reminds me of uh, sort of the related initiative that you've talked about in, in the book and, and a bit here about, um, I guess, ensuring that for this new group of young AI researchers, there are the opportunities to pursue AI research with uh, the, the resources that are required nowadays. And I think you did touch a bit on this earlier, but I'm wondering if uh, there's anything else you would want to add on sort of what you see as perhaps the need for that kind of public funding of uh, AI resources and computational resources to support AI research so that it's not necessarily just happening, you know, at certain companies. Yeah, Jeremy, this does concern me. I think we really urgently need more public resourcing, public sector resourcing of AI. Like you said, um, you know, for the young generation, they begin their journey mostly in school and uh, they need the faculty to teach them. They need to experience the making of AI in the public sector and our hundreds of thousands of incredible researchers, whether they're biochemists or civil engineers or political scientists or, you know, law, legal scholars and economists, neuroscientists, uh, clinicians, they are in public sector needing this tool, needing the resource to do the kind of new generation of discovery and uh, study. And I think that is um, urgently needed because um, the, 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 you know, I... Mm-hmm. I hear about Silicon Valley um, big tech or even big tech backed startups resource in terms of the, the compute, uh, the number of chips or, or, or cloud 
cloud uh, uh, credits or whatever you measure compared to what even a school like Stanford has. And it's orders and orders of magnitude different. I don't think academia or public sector needs to necessarily completely match the, the, the scale of industry. But if you are too many orders different, then we no longer can use this tool properly. We no longer can use the latest technology to help discover cure for cancer. We no longer can look under the hood of what this technology is and do the proper assessment and evaluation and transparent understanding. So we, this gap right now is too large and we need to urgently do something to, to bridge that. On that note, um, Feifei, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me and to talk us through your journey and, and for writing the thank book you, as well. Thank <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Afterwards podcast. We want to make sure you know about our latest podcast, Books That Shaped America. It's a companion podcast to our 10-week television series of the same name. We've teamed up with the Library of Congress and selected 10 books from across American history that have had a major impact on our society. Each week, the C-SPAN television program will focus on one of these books and its impact. This companion podcast will give you more background on the book's authors. If you want to learn more about books that shaped America, go to our website, c-span.org. The podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.